Liam and I had been looking forward to this retreat for months. The moment we set our eyes on the quaint, remote cabin nestled among dense woods in the listing, we knew it was the perfect escape from our hectic city lives. As we drove up the narrow trail leading to our temporary sanctuary, the serene quiet of the wilderness enveloped us, promising the peace we so desperately sought. Our first night was everything we had hoped for. The cabin, with its rustic charm and cozy fireplace, felt like a step back in time. We cooked a simple meal, played some old records, and watched as the sun dipped below the towering pines, casting long shadows across the frosted ground. However, as we curled up under the thick blankets, the wind outside began to howl with a ferocity that seemed almost personal. By morning, the world was a blur of white and gray. A severe snowstorm had descended upon us overnight, isolating us from the civilization we had left behind. As we peered out of the frosty window, the realization hit us. Our supplies wouldn't last more than a few days, especially if the storm continued. What had started as an idyllic escape quickly turned into a precarious situation. With our safety and well-being suddenly thrust into uncertainty, the storm showed no signs of abating as it raged on through our second day at the cabin. Liam and I, determined not to let our spirits sink, decided to ration our dwindling supplies. We carefully divided the food we brought, calculating each portion to ensure we could last until the storm cleared. We spent the day huddled near the fireplace, feeding at the last of the logs, trying to preserve every bit of warmth. Attempting to call for help became our recurrent, futile task. Each time we dialed out, the stubborn, no-service notification flashed on our screens, mocking our growing desperation. The isolation, so cherished at the outset of our trip, now loomed over us like a specter, its weight increasingly oppressive. As evening approached, the temperature inside the cabin began to plummet. Puzzled, Liam checked the thermostat to find it unresponsive. A deeper examination revealed our worst fears. The heating system had failed. With no knowledge of repairs and no hope of professional help arriving through the blizzard, we were left shivering, our situation growing more dire by the hour. The cold seeped into every corner of the cabin, an uninvited and pervasive guest. We layered on all the clothing we had, but the biting chill was relentless. Each breath we exhaled materialized into a cloud of vapor, hanging in the dimly lit air of the cabin like a ghostly reminder of our vulnerability. That night, as we lay in bed listening to the wind's eerie symphony, the romantic notion of our secluded getaway had fully evaporated replaced by a stark reality of survival. As we drifted into a restless sleep, the unnerving silence of the snow-covered wilderness was broken only by the occasional crack and groan of the cabin settling under the weight of the snow. On the third day, just as Liam and I were trying to concoct a breakfast from our sparse supplies, a sudden knock echoed through the cabin, startling us both. It was an odd, desperate rhythm that cut sharply through the howl of the blizzard. Cautiously, we approached the door, through the peephole, a shadowy figure loomed, swaddled in snow-laden layers. Opening the door, we were met by a man with frost clinging to his beard, his eyes wide with relief. He introduced himself as Tom, a hiker caught off guard by the storm. Compassion outweighed our hesitation, and we invited him inside, offering him warmth and a chance to dry off. As Tom settled in, thawing by the fire and sipping the hot tea we provided, his gratitude was palpable. Yet, as he shared his story of how he ended up at our door, inconsistencies began to surface. His timeline of the hike, his reasons for being so far from any trail, and even his knowledge of the local area shifted with each telling. This, coupled with his nervous glances and fidgety demeanor, started to unnerve us. Liam and I exchanged worried looks, our hospitality warring with a creeping sense of dread as the storm outside mirrored the rising tension within. As the hours passed, Tom's initial relief at being indoors faded, replaced by an uneasy restlessness. He paced the small cabin, peering out windows and frequently checking his phone for a signal. His interest in the specifics of our cabin became increasingly conspicuous. He asked pointed questions about our food supplies, the cabin's exits, and even the reliability of the locks on the doors and windows. His behavior began to prick at our nerves, turning our worry into suspicion. In an effort to help, I offered to dry Tom's damp clothes near the fireplace. 
As I collected his belongings, a folded piece of paper slipped from one of his pockets. Curiosity overtook me, and I unfolded it, revealing it to be a flyer. The flyer was marked with bold letters stating WANTED, accompanied by a photo that, unmistakably, was of Tom. According to the flyer, he was wanted by local authorities for a series of burglaries in nearby towns. The blood drained from my face as realization set in. With trembling hands, I showed the flyer to Liam. His eyes widened in shock, and we shared a silent moment of fear. We had unwittingly sheltered someone potentially dangerous. The coziness of our cabin transformed instantly into a confining trap, with the storm outside no longer the only threat to our safety. The air in the cabin grew thick with tension as Liam and I confronted Tom with the flyer, his face contorted through a rapid succession of emotions, surprise, anger, and then a cold, calculating calm. He laughed nervously, attempting to dismiss the flyer as a misunderstanding, but his eyes betrayed a hint of desperation. He became aggressive, asserting that no one would be going anywhere until the storm passed. Fearing for our safety, Liam and I knew we had to act swiftly. In a moment of distraction, as Tom was pacing near the door, I whispered a plan to Liam. Using a combination of our wits and makeshift weapons, a heavy lamp and a kitchen chair, we managed to push Tom into the small storage room off the main living area. With hearts pounding, we locked the door, securing it with a piece of broken shelving to ensure it couldn't be easily forced open. Trapped in the room, Tom's muffled threats seeped through the walls, sending chills down our spines. Liam and I, now safe but shaken, debated our next steps. The storm was still raging, making the idea of leaving perilous, yet staying meant hours, or potentially days, with a criminal just feet away. We weighed our limited options, each more daunting than the last, as we prepared for the long, uncertain hours ahead. Using every ounce of our ingenuity, Liam and I began to fortify our temporary fortress. We scavenged the cabin for anything that could be used to strengthen our barricades. Heavy furniture was pushed against doors and kitchen knives were placed within reach in case Tom managed to break free. We huddled together, watching the windows as snow continued to blanket everything in white, preparing ourselves for a long wait until the storm weakened enough for us to venture outside. As dawn broke the next day, the relentless storm began to ebb, unveiling a landscape cloaked in a pristine, thick blanket of snow. Tom, his earlier defiance reduced to a quiet resignation, followed us without protest. Armed cautiously with a fireplace poker and a frying pan, we escorted him out of the cabin, the crisp morning air biting at our cheeks. The path to the nearest ranger station was obscured under feet of fresh snow, making every step uncertain and treacherous. Despite the clear dangers that lay ahead, the hope of reaching safety kept us moving forward, pushing through the deep, untouched snow. As a seasoned business consultant, the stress of constantly bouncing from one city to another had taken its toll, so I opted for an Airbnb this time. Something about blending the comfort of a home with the alienation of travel appealed to me, especially with a high-stakes conference looming over me. The place I chose was quaint, nestled in a quiet neighborhood, promising a much-needed retreat from the bustling conference schedule. Walking into the Airbnb, my first impressions were overwhelmingly positive. The decor was tasteful, the living space inviting. However, there was one thing that slightly unsettled me, an oddly placed mirror in my bedroom. It was large and ornately framed, positioned directly opposite the bed. Something about it seemed peculiar, but I shrugged off the feeling, attributing it to my knack for overthinking after a long day of travel. Little did I know, this seemingly innocuous object would soon cast a long, disturbing shadow over what was supposed to be a calm stay. During my second evening, as I was returning from the day's sessions, I bumped into someone right outside the front door. Hey, you must be Ethan, he exclaimed with an easy grin, extending his hand. I'm Ben, staying next door for the week. His demeanor was amiable, and it was refreshing to meet another guest, especially one who seemed to know his way around the local area. We hit it off quickly, and Ben suggested we grab dinner at a nearby restaurant he'd been raving about. Over dinner, our conversation meandered from trivial chatter about the neighborhood to more personal topics like our careers. 
Ben seemed unusually interested in the details of my consulting work, asking pointed questions about my clients and travel habits. His curiosity was intense, yet it seemed harmless. Just another business professional interested in networking, or so I thought. As we were wrapping up our meal, my phone buzzed with an incoming call. Glancing at the screen, I noticed it wasn't a number I recognized. It's probably for me, Ben said nonchalantly, but the quick, almost nervous flicker in his eye was the first sign that something was off. I was puzzled but handed him the phone, intrigued by his assumption. Ben answered the call on speaker, and I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. A gruff voice on the other end inquired urgently, Is the next target lined up? This question was stark and alarming. Ben's initial reaction was a momentary look of shock, which he quickly masked with a nervous laugh, dismissing the caller with a hurried, wrong number, sorry about that, before ending the call. This strange interaction left me with an uneasy feeling. Ben's quick claim that the call was meant for him, despite it coming to my phone, and his awkward handling of the question about a target, were both deeply suspicious and hinted at a hidden agenda I was yet to understand. Returning home after the conference, I tried to settle back into my routine, but something felt unsettling, like a nagging thought I couldn't quite shake. My unease was confirmed when I noticed a series of fraudulent charges on my credit card statement, all from high-end stores I'd never visited. Panic set in further when I received multiple emails thanking me for applying for loans, applications I never filled out. My mind raced back to the dinner with Ben and that strange phone call. Could he be involved? Determined to get to the bottom of this, I first reached out to my bank to report the fraud and secure my accounts. Then, I called the Airbnb host, hoping to learn more about Ben. The host's response sent a cold shiver down my spine. According to their records, there had been no guest named Ben booked into any part of the property during my stay. The plot thickened, and suspicion about Ben intensified. Fueled by a growing sense of betrayal, I decided to investigate further. Remembering the odd mirror in my bedroom, I searched online for similar items and stumbled upon a chilling discovery. It was listed as a two-way mirror, commonly used for covert surveillance. My heart sank as I realized the extent to which my privacy had been invaded. I contacted local authorities. They were intrigued by the case and decided to inspect the Airbnb property. Their investigation confirmed my fears. Behind the mirror was a hidden camera setup presumably streaming footage to whoever was orchestrating this invasion of privacy. It was clear now that this was no coincidence, but a premeditated breach of trust and security. The evidence pointed increasingly towards Ben, but I needed more proof to understand the full extent of his deceit and bring him to justice. Analyzing security footage from the cameras hidden within the Airbnb, the police captured clear images of Ben frequently entering the house, sometimes accompanied by individuals I had never seen. The footage showed him and his accomplices installing the equipment and reviewing data on laptops. And this was no amateur operation. It was clear they knew exactly what they were doing. As the investigation deepened, the police dug into Ben's background, uncovering that his real name was Benjamin Clark, and he was, shockingly, the son of my Airbnb host. This hit me like a ton of bricks. Not only had I been deceived, but I'd been targeted by a family-run syndicate that used their rental property as a front for a large-scale identity theft operation. Detectives explained that Ben and his father had been running this scam for years, targeting unsuspecting business travelers who would be less likely to notice irregularities during their stays. Their operation was well-oiled, using the information gathered from their surveillance to commit fraud and theft on a grand scale. With the full extent of their criminal enterprise exposed, the police devised a sting operation to capture Ben and his father. I agreed to play a central role, posing as a potential guest interested in another extended stay. The plan was to lure them into a sense of security, believing they could victimize me again. We set up at a different Airbnb property, one that was under police surveillance, equipped with hidden cameras to catch every interaction. I made the booking under a pseudonym, and as expected, Ben and his father took the bait. They believed they could repeat their earlier success without suspicion, demonstrating the arrogance that often accompanies unchecked criminal behavior. When Ben and his father arrived to prepare the property, the police swooped in, caught red-handed with incriminating evidence on them, 
including digital devices full of stolen data from various guests. They were arrested on the spot. During the interrogation, Ben, realizing the gravity of his situation, confessed. He detailed their method of selecting victims based on their financial profiles and the ease with which they could access their personal information, hoping for leniency by cooperating with the authorities. Back at home, the comforts of my own space brought a deep sense of safety, now reinforced by multiple layers of security. Yet, the shadow of past events lingered. One evening, while reviewing the logs from my home security system, a chilling discovery unsettled the peace. There was an attempt from an unknown device trying to connect to my network. This stark reminder that the tentacles of my past ordeal might still reach out for me sharpened my resolve. Vigilance would be a permanent part of my life now, a necessary armor against the hidden dangers of a connected world. After months tethered to the relentless pace of city life, I desperately needed a breather. My choice? A quaint village far from the urban sprawl, promising peace and a touch of solitude. The apartment I rented online seemed perfect, small, cozy, nestled within the heart of the village and managed by an on-site caretaker named Mr. Jennings. Upon my arrival, Mr. Jennings greeted me with a smile that was both warm and, somehow, slightly unsettling. He was an older man. His was friendly, but with an odd edge to it that I couldn't quite place. As he showed me around the charming apartment, he repeatedly emphasized how safe and private it was. You'll have no worries here, he assured me, his voice a soothing balm to my frayed nerves. At first, his assurances made me feel secure, a refugee from the chaos I had left behind. But there was something in the way he lingered a little too long at the door a look that seemed to size me up a bit too thoroughly, that left a whisper of unease at the back of my mind. The first few nights were uneventful, and I began to settle in, appreciating the quiet that the village offered. However, it didn't take long for small, peculiar things to catch my attention. I'd wake up to find books, not where I left them the night before, or my toiletries slightly rearranged. At first, I dismissed these instances as the absent-minded results of my own doing. But then came the faint sounds of footsteps outside my door late at night and doors that I had closed firmly at bedtime, found slightly ajar in the morning. Mr. Jennings's behavior also began to shift. His visits became more frequent and unpredictably timed. He would knock softly and enter under the pretense of checking plumbing issues he was just reminded of, or he would bring extra linens I hadn't requested. Each unannounced visit added layers to my growing discomfort as his reasons seemed less about my needs and more about finding reasons to enter the apartment. The day I found the camera, however, was the day my unease turned into genuine alarm. It was hidden in a decorative vase on the living room shelf, a spot I had admired daily for its quaint charm. Upon closer inspection, while dusting, my hand brushed against something hard and distinctly out of place. A small black lens stared back at me the moment I peered inside. Panic gripped me as the realization set in. Every moment of my supposed solitude had been under surveillance. I began to seriously question not only my safety, but the true intentions of Mr. Jennings. As soon as Mr. Jennings left the apartment for his daily errands, I seized my opportunity. My heart pounded as I systematically searched the apartment. It didn't take long before my worst fears were confirmed. More cameras were cunningly hidden throughout the living space. Behind the mirror in the bathroom, within the clusters of faux flowers, and even embedded in the television's decorative frame, I found them all, each discovery sending a new chill down my spine. I rushed to my laptop. Driven by a mix of fear and urgency, I managed to connect to one of the camera's feeds. The screen flickered to life, revealing a live broadcast of the apartment's interior. My temporary home, now a stage for unseen viewers. I clicked through links and tabs, tracing the stream back to its source. A secure, password-protected website with a chat interface displaying disturbing comments from anonymous watchers. The full weight of my situation crashed down on me. Not only was I being watched, but there was also an audience for this invasion of my privacy. 
The horror of it all twisted in my gut, as I realized that Mr. Jennings was not just a peculiar old man, but a perpetrator of a deeply intrusive and sinister violation. My mind raced as I contemplated my next steps, knowing that my sense of safety was irrevocably shattered. When Mr. Jennings returned, I was waiting, the screen of my laptop glowing ominously in the dimly lit room. As he entered, his usual smile faltered under my steely gaze. I confronted him immediately, holding up prints of the camera feeds. His initial reaction was to deny, his voice tinged with feigned shock as he claimed ignorance. But as I pressed on, his facade crumbled, the room filled with a heavy silence before he finally admitted to everything. With a defeated slump of his shoulders, Mr. Jennings confessed to installing the cameras and streaming my daily activities to an exclusive audience on the dark web. The twist of the knife came when he revealed more about his audience. They're not just random perverts, he said with a hollow laugh, but people you might see on TV or read about in the papers. They pay well to watch. Ordinary people like you live their ordinary lives. His words echoed ominously, suggesting a network much larger and more corrupt than I could have imagined. This revelation sent a cold shudder through me, realizing that I was entangled in something far bigger and more dangerous than just an invasion of privacy. As Mr. Jennings stood there, the pathetic truth of his existence laid bare. I knew that I had to act swiftly, not only to protect myself, but to expose this horrific breach of trust and privacy. I feigned interest in Mr. Jennings's twisted scheme. Imagine how much more they would pay to be part of the scene rather than just watching it, I suggested. Watching his eyes light up with a greedy spark, he nodded eagerly, falling into the trap as he pulled out his phone to contact one of his high-profile viewers. As he typed away, I carefully memorized the pattern of his unlock swipe. My heart raced, but I kept my expression neutral, my mind working furiously. Once he set the phone down and turned to make us coffee, I seized the moment. With trembling hands, I replicated the unlock pattern and quickly composed an SOS message to send to my friend, including the apartment's address and a brief explanation of the situation. I replaced the phone just as Mr. Jennings returned, my pulse pounding in my ears, hoping my message would bring help before it was too late. As the tension peaked, blue and red lights flashed through the apartment windows. The police arrived just in time, intercepting Mr. Jennings and the guest he had invited over. Both were arrested on the spot, their expressions of shock mirroring the chaos of the scene. I was rescued from what could have become an even more harrowing ordeal. In the aftermath, I gave a detailed statement to the police, recounting every part of my nightmare. The evidence I collected was crucial in shutting down not just this operation, but potentially helping to investigate other similar setups. Months later, my phone buzzed with anonymous messages. Your performance was captivating. The chilling thought that some viewers still watched or recognized me in public haunted me. Despite my efforts, the shadow of exposure lingered, reminding me that the camera's eye might never 